I think we just, you know, uh, come together, you know, look at the mistakes we made, you know, find a way to fix those mistakes and to get our eyes ahead to Louisville and, you know, get the best game plan we can to, to beat those guys. Um, we know who we are. You know, this, this program's built on, you know, tough times. And, you know, I have no doubt that we'll be just fine and, and you know, we'll come back strong. And we're back with Tiger Net Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Golden, with my co-host, David Hood. And, David, we've got a, an interesting game to talk about. Yeah, it was uh, an interesting trip up to Notre Dame last week, that's for sure. They, uh, The Tigers did not play really well. Notre Dame played really well. I had a great trip. I mean, I had fun eating food, almost getting killed in Chicago, uh taking rental cars back in the middle of the night uh seeing that that historic and iconic Notre Dame Stadium so uh an interesting trip uh you know the one loss uh type deal that wasn't exactly the way everybody wanted it to end up unless you're a Notre Dame fan but but a great game and I also heard that our our guest from last week Tim Bure got engaged isn't that fantastic um you know Kay, Kay Davis his fiance uh, wow that's awesome to say his fiance she's great she's a uh, as he as Dabo said yesterday, she's a gamecock. Uh, one of the best gamecocks I've ever met. I love her to death. And uh, you know, I have really never broached the subject with them of, hey, why aren't you guys gonna get married? Because they've been together for a long time. You just don't get into somebody's business that way. But um, it's exciting for me. I'm I'm glad to hear that uh, Tim did it and he did it at Notre Dame. So uh, a Notre Dame graduate who loves Clemson ask a South Carolina graduate to marry him at a Clemson Notre Dame game. I mean, what, what could be better than that? Tim Beret is marrying a Gamecock. Um, love really conquers all. It, it truly does. And like I said, you know, he even said that, that uh, she cries during Clemson senior day because she gets to know a lot of these guys too. And uh, she's, she's fantastic people. She really is. And uh, uh, I just hope that I get an invite to the wedding. Yeah, uh, it will be an interesting one. I'm sure it will be. Uh, I'm sure he's somebody we don't have to worry about having one of those fall weddings. So that, that will be good. Yeah, it won't be on a Clemson football Saturday. I can guarantee you that or a Notre Dame football Saturday. So uh, we'll we'll get back to the game. You know, obviously the, the weather was uh, was a big story. Um, Super windy up there to the point that Notre Dame in their tailgating lots wouldn't let people put their their canopies and their tents up. I mean, extremely high winds, and that seemed to really affect Clemson's passing game. You know, I think it did a little bit. Uh, you know, the wind was swirling there in the first quarter, but, you know, I was watching warm-ups and, and just didn't see the quarterbacks having that bad of a problem. Kyle Richardson, the tight ends coach, said that he was having problems in warm-ups. He was overthrowing guys. So, uh, you know, I'm not real sure if it was that big of a problem later in the game but but I, I have to tell you man we we're walking through the through the tailgate lots and uh it reminded me of going to pit last year a lot of flags everywhere a lot of really tall 40 foot flag poles and uh my wife Nikki she goes what's the deal with all the flags because you look and somebody would have a like the Mexican flag and the Canadian flag none of them looked you know to be Mexican or Canadian I don't know because they they had you know maybe Indiana or Kentucky plates on their car uh, somebody else had the POW MIA flag and one other. And so we asked them and they said that, uh, you know, because the way that, that they tailgate up there in those huge parking lots, uh, it's easier to find your friends tailgates if they let you know what flags they're flying. <laughs> so somebody will say, hey, I'm under the Duke basketball POW MIA flag this week. And they run it up a 40 foot flagpole and you can see it from a mile away. And then that's how everybody knows where to go tailgate. So interesting stuff. And then when we were walking in, uh, you know, I thought it was funny. Uh, uh, I asked a, a Notre Dame guy who who proudly told me as he wore his letterman's jacket from 1961 that he still fits in, uh, you know, where a certain place was. And he goes, I, I don't know. You know, I've only been here almost 100 years. You'd think I'd know everything on campus by now. Great people. And then there was a, a, a wind gust that caught a concession area and I saw so many napkins go flying and then somebody had left an elderly gentleman in a wheelchair to go do something and the wheelchair starts rolling down the sidewalk and it looks like he's about to tip over 
And so we we kind of had to go grab him and make sure that he was going to be okay. I've never seen win like that at a football game. It was insane. Just, I mean, that's just, I mean, that is incredible, incredible stuff. And, and, and yeah, it absolutely was just, I mean, it was when the, you really can't, you can't, you can't prepare for that. No. And, you know, so earlier in the week, we were thinking that, that maybe what you would have to prepare for was 15 mile an hour winds and rain. So the rain goes away and instead you've got 40 to 60 mile an hour gusts and, uh, you know, old men blowing away and napkins blowing away. And, uh, you know, like I said, I don't know how much it affected it. Clemson, I think, was going to throw it short anyway, uh, at least early in the game. I think maybe they thought they saw something out on the perimeter. Didn't seem to have a lot of flow to it. Later on, they were able to throw deep down the field. Uh, I would have loved to have seen Clemson take those deep shots earlier in the game and, and tried to open things up, which has kind of been a criticism of the offense all year. But, you know, everything just seems to – at least the last few weeks, is is not over the middle of the field. They did a great job through the first seven weeks, to me, of throwing to the tight ends, getting Brenning Stool, getting Davis Allen involved, uh, down the seams, down the middle, uh, taking a few shots here and there, and then that all just disappeared against the Irish. Yeah, and, and so the, the big thing is uh, that, that I noticed is – Davis Allen was the leading receiver, seven receptions, 60 yards. The issue was is that when they would throw to Davis, it was usually on third and long, and he was running a short, he was running a you know five, six yard route, and it was it, it would lead to fourth down. I mean, it it just it felt like he could have been better utilized on first or second down to to pick up some of that yardage. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. Um I have, as I had mentioned before, these offensive uh Coaches, guys who've coached, uh, you know, the college game, the high school game, that I kind of depend on. Hey, what what are you seeing? What are you what are you looking at here? And, and you know, all three of them kind of said the same thing. It just looks like the coaches aren't trusting DJ right now, and then DJ isn't trusting DJ right now. Uh, Kyle Richardson was talking about uh, DJ tries to be maybe too perfect, and he's not trusting what his eyes see right there. And a perfect example is that fourth down call, fourth and four at the 40 or wherever it was. And DJ takes the snap. And I think you see a wide receiver running open on the left side of the field. You see a tight end flashing open in the middle of the field. And he throws into double coverage down to Bo. And then you go, okay, so is that just because he trusts Bo? Uh, you know, but it wasn't really a catchable ball. And, and Kyle's like, hey, maybe we do come down with that. Or maybe we do get pass interference if it's, something that's you you know catchable so just a lot of things going wrong right now with this Clemson offense and uh you know we'll we'll talk about that more next you know as we look at next week in Louisville uh but but yeah so at some point either the coaches got to turn it loose and trust DJ or DJ's got to trust DJ yeah I mean it, it definitely feels like for whatever reason that they're they're not trusting him which is weird because it it felt like we got to a point finally, I think about the NC State game that that they really trusted him and and you know for that middle eight of the Florida State game and when we saw creativity, we saw the flea flicker, we saw all kinds of stuff that they were kind of letting him turn loose and then I don't know if if something happened during the Syracuse game or what, but it's sort of like they put the put the brakes back on him. Yep, don't get it. Uh, I wish you know that I could be in the offensive meeting room, figure that out. It was one of the questions. Uh, you know, when we go down to do the post-game interviews, first of all, another thing about Notre Dame Stadium, you know, you, you and nothing nothing against DPI or anything like that. But you go to a lot of stadiums and you have show pros or EPI people who are the ushers and, you know, they wear the bright colored pink or the yellow shirts or whatever. Notre Dame ushers are dressed up and they have on, you know, the hats that look like either police hats or the military dress hats or whatever. And they have name badges. And, you know, one guy that I was talking to, uh, you know, he was telling me that he hasn't missed a game since like 1971, that he's been an usher at that stadium through, you know, all of those games. And, uh, you know, they have all of these kind of uh, older guys who are vested in it. They're dressed up. Uh, So I go down to interviews and we kind of get past him and we get into the interview area. And I tell Nikki, she says, who are you going to grab? And I said, well, apparently I'm going to get the defensive guys. So I'll get Wes Goodwin. She said, what do you want me to ask Brandon Streeter? First question is, why did everything go sideways? Why why was everything at the line of scrimmage? Nine of the first 10 throws were five yards or back. And, and you're not you're not stretching the defense at that point. You're not making them defend the entire part of the field. 
you're making them defend one little corner. And that's just frustrating. And, you know, I, I'm a student of history. And as a student of history, especially military history, and you go back and you look at some of the greatest generals of all time, you can start going back all the way to freaking Genghis Khan. You can come up and you can go to Robert E. Lee in the Civil War or, uh, you know, whoever whoever you want to look at. The greatest generals have always been on the attack. It doesn't matter if you're outnumbered. It doesn't matter if, uh, you know, you feel like maybe the, the situation isn't the best for you. You attack because when you attack, you evoke confidence in yourself. And right now, it just doesn't look like they are attacking. They are trying to peace drives together and, and hope that somebody can break a play. Well, what you want to see them do, and I know I'm getting passionate about this, you want to just see them go at it, man. Attack, 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 attack. Tennessee, bless their hearts, they got beat by Georgia. What they got beat by was a great defense. And, you know, we know great defense a lot of times is going to beat great offense. And I kind of had a feeling that they would run into that in the Georgia game. But they keep attacking. That's what I love about their offense. They're they're constantly trying to find mismatches. There is motion. There's eye candy. There's mistrust. And they attack, attack, attack. And that's what I'd love to see out of Clemson. Just for once, just once, let me see it, please. You know, one, I agree. I think I would love to see more attacking. I'd love to see more aggressiveness. I think that one thing I want to kind of flow, and, and I want to preface this by saying that I'm not blaming the refs because that's loser talk. I mean, you know, and the fact is it was a 21-point game. You can't there, – there's more to that. But one thing that kind of caught my eye, first play – you know, a very successful screen that gets called back because of holding. Second, uh, second or third play, same thing happens. And I kind of wonder when you get a call that early in a game this late, you kind of wonder if this wasn't something that Bo Collins had gotten away with all season long. And then the officials decided, oh, we're going to call this in this game. And it kind of threw the whole rhythm off. Yeah, you know, to me, Clemson's receivers just haven't blocked very well on the perimeter in a few years. There's been there's been times that they have. There's been times when I see God out there really blocking his butt off. I really like what he does. Uh, some of the other guys made me a little bit of a lackluster effort uh, on the perimeter. So you just you don't know, and you don't know if they pick up that first down. Maybe it's different. But but again, even if they pick up that first down there. It, it's still a grind. It's still trying to put together a 10 or 11 play drive without making a mistake. And right now defense has realized that. And they say, Hey, Clemson, you can't put an 11 play drive together without your right tackle going off sides at least once or, or, you know, false start once or twice or without a holding call or without the wide receivers missing a block out on the perimeter. You just can't. And, you know, it's just so evident because, uh, you know, Bo, bless his heart, he's going to be out this week. That left shoulder was wrapped up when he came out of Notre Dame. Has the holding call. They come back to the other side of the field. He whiffs on a block. And, you know, they miss a chance there. And then he goes back to the other side and he, and he, and he holds again. And you go, holy cow. Like, you know, can it go any can it go any worse? And, you know, again, that that's why I say attack. Uh, quit quit leaving it up to wide receivers to 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 hold out on the perimeter and go down the field. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And, and yeah, our Clipson's receivers need to be able to block. That's that's not an issue. But at the end of the day, you've got this talent on there. Run them deep, you know, you know, throw them. And, and that, that used to be such a big part of the Clipson offense was, you know, everybody calls it the 50-50 ball. Clipson called it the 80-20 ball because he had guys like T. Higgins. Um, you know, you go back even like my, you have Mike Williams, Deion Kane, just guys that – when you if, if nothing else is there, you know you can throw it up deep and they're going to be there. And, and Clemson doesn't have that right now. Yeah, that's uh, you know somebody was asking me, and I, you know we may have even talked about it here on the podcast. Uh, Clemson making the playoff, and I go, do, do you really want Clemson in the playoff right now? This iteration of Clemson, I still think this team can play well if they if they make the right play calls, if uh, you know they make the right decision at quarterback. Uh, you know, can they can they make a run? Sure, they can. But this current iteration, do you want them in the playoff? No, because right now Georgia would probably gobsmack them, right? Uh, it's just the way it is. They wouldn't score on that Georgia defense. Tennessee scored 13. Uh, so, uh, you know, 
yes, they have to find a deep threat. They they have to be able to go down the field. Uh, they're not getting elite quarterback play. They're not getting elite uh, wide receiver play. And that's what I told somebody. I said, look, as much as I love going to the playoff and and I hope Clemson makes it because it's a lot of fun for me. And, uh, hey, we, we have some bowl news that I think I can discuss here in just a second. Uh, you know, Clemson doesn't have Mike Williams running out at wide receiver anymore. They don't have Arteva Scott running out at wide receiver anymore. There's no Jordan Leggett out there. There, there's no T. Higgins running out there. There's no Justin Ross. Trevor Lawrence is playing with the Jags. Deshaun Watson's waiting to get out of NFL jail up in Cleveland. Those guys just aren't there, and, and there's nobody that's really close. I love Will Shipley. He's not Travis Etienne. And, you know, that's why I go back to this offense, and, and you look even at 2018, 2019 with Etienne, uh, 2020, there were times that this offense, you could see the struggle starting, even with Trevor even with Travis, and it would be a third and 12, and Trevor would dump it off to Travis, who would break four tackles and gain 19 yards, and you would get a first down. And you, How many drives did we see like that where that fantastic player just, just makes a play or Trevor just makes an incredible throw, and he puts it on a guy's face mask in the corner of the end zone? We just haven't seen that, and, uh, you know, for this team, it's just it's, – it's a, it's, a, it's a grind. You know, Travis had a, had a unique ability to take a play that looked like it was going to be a loss and turn it to a gain. I mean, I, I, we saw it for four years. It was it was phenomenal. And and I think that that is some of the issue is that, you know, as good as Shipley is, we just – we saw we, – Clemson – people who follow Clemson got spoiled. I mean, we saw some elite generational talent, and it's not to say Shipley isn't that. It's just – it's a, it's unfair to Will Shipley to say, why aren't you doing everything Travis Etienne could do? Because – ETN did some stuff that not everybody can do. Yeah, and, and again, you know, you don't have to you don't have to have that to go win a national championship. I think, you know, Alabama, the first couple of under Saban were, were were game manager type quarterbacks with great running backs and and decent wide receivers. They ran the football. Then Saban goes up, faces Clemson and Sean Watson in 2015, and says, "Hey, I need to change." the way that I'm doing things, uh, you know, so, so you don't have to have that to win. I think there's some teams out there that, you know, kind of fit that bill. TCU has great, great wide receivers. Uh, we know that Michigan is a running football team. They're going to be in the conversation. Uh, but this team just has to find somebody that wants to make a play. They just have to find somebody that's got some fire in them. Uh, somebody that's going to come out and go, you know what? Put it on my shoulders. Give me, give me the ball. Uh, I, I go back. People know. I, I've got a couple stories that I can tell on that. You know, we uh, I played softball uh, around the country uh, for a long time, and I had a guy that I played with that is, is maybe the greatest softball player that I've ever seen. And we were playing in a big tournament, and uh, we got into the losers bracket because he he had a bad game, and he stomped around there for a little bit, and. Uh, you know, he came back in between games and he goes, guys, just get on base and ride me. And and dude, dude hit four grand slams in one game and kind of came back. You want somebody that goes, give me the football. I want the ball at crunch time. And, uh, you know, I think that there is a lack of voices out there. I think Will Shipley tries. Uh, I don't think DJ's that guy right now. Uh, I think they need that voice out there, both offensively and defensively. Yeah, I mean that, and that was Deshaun in the in the 2016 championship. You know, let let's go be legends. Let's go be legendary. And they drove down the field and beat Alabama. I mean, it's just something that that is that is needed. And and it, you're right. I don't know that it's there. Well, you've you've piqued my interest. What uh what bold news do we have? Uh, you know, I have heard uh, kind of through the grapevine that uh, the ACC teams who are eligible met with some of the bowls in Charlotte a little bit earlier this week, and. Uh, you know, so the I think the general thought right now is that if Clemson wins out and wins the ACC and they miss the playoff, that they would go to the Orange Bowl and maybe they would play Alabama. And I think that that is probably the most likely scenario, right? But I have also heard, and people kind of forget, so I think everybody thinks that the ACC champion automatically goes to the Orange Bowl. And I really need confirmation on this, but I have been told that no, that if a team is ranked right outside of that top four, the committee can slot them somewhere in one of those New York six games or a New Year's six games. 
and that the Cotton Bowl is really interested in Clemson. The Holiday Bowl is freaking interested in Clemson. Uh, that's not a New Year's Six game. But, the, you know, there is a chance that Clemson has been to the Orange Bowl before. Uh, they've played Alabama before, trying to look for something new. You know, maybe yeah, there's an outside chance Clemson could wind up in a Cotton Bowl uh, somehow. That's what I've been told. I need to kind of confirm it. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know that Clemson would fall to the cheese at Bowl. I don't know that the cheese at Bowl, if Clemson was to lose a game or two here the rest of the way, if they're going to fall there, would they go to the Gator Bowl? You know, I think that would probably be more of an option than the, than the cheese that, like I said, the Holiday Bowl has made it known. And Clemson has made reservations with all of these bowl games. They've made hotel reservations kind of across the board. Uh, you know, and me personally, look, I, I know people love Miami. And I know that South Beach is 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 intriguing. And I know that, uh, uh, you know, going down to, to Miami and the balmy weather and the Everglades and uh, and all that is is probably what people would love to do over Christmas. And like the Orange Bowl treats you great. But as a media person, that Cotton Bowl where Clemson went and played Notre Dame, it's the best bowl game I've ever been to from a standpoint of the media. Uh, and, and as a foodie, you know, you walk in and, they have these like uh, um, shelves that are probably eight or nine shelves high, and there were probably ten of them. And they had these bowls out there, and it was full size Snickers and Butterfingers and Milky Ways and every kind of candy and candy bar imaginable, every drink imaginable. Dr Pepper like on demand over there, fruit on demand. Like I probably ate fifty cantaloupes that week. I probably ate five watermelons by myself because I'm not a real big chocolate guy, even though I did, did take some Snickers. Uh, you know, they they walk in and it's like, hey, for your media gift, would you like to go sit on the front row to see the Dallas Mavericks play the Pelicans? Heck, yeah, I would. That was fantastic. So I go to the Mavericks game. Guess who's sitting in front of me? Noah Sindergaard, who now pitches, you know, for the Phillies, but was with the Mets at the time. So I'm sitting here going, I'd take the Cotton Bowl. Uh, you know, I really would, would hope that Clemson can turn this around to make the playoff. Uh, I would be okay with the Orange Bowl. I think my wife would like the Orange Bowl. She would take the kids down there, throw them in the ocean, see what happens, see if any sharks get them or anything. Uh, but but I think there's just some different scenarios out on the table that people don't know about. It's definitely, I think, wherever Clemson goes, it can be a fun trip and it can be a good game, which which is exciting. So you, you talk about Florida, talk about the trip to Florida, which I think, is a good segue to addressing the elephant in the room. The former Clemson offensive coordinator, Jeff Scott, who's was the head coach at South Florida has been let go. And all of a sudden, you know, the, everybody starts wondering, is he going to make a comeback to Clemson? Yeah. So I texted Jeff earlier this week, did not ask him that question a little bit uh, too soon, but you know, from what I understand for, for right now, for people thinking that Jeff's going to be on staff next week or, you know, man, come in as an analyst or something like that for the run. You know, I've kind of heard that that he's going to just take this time and be with his family and, uh, you know, really talk about where they want to go next. Does he want to, you know, chase an OC job somewhere different? Would Dabo want him back? Maybe Tony Elliott wants to hire him at Virginia. You know, maybe Brent Venables uh, would love to have him out at Oklahoma. You just don't know. And I think that Jeff, because he's a great recruiter, because he has that history, He's going to have a lot of options. And, you know, there's a part of me that wonders professionally if he would want to come back to Clemson because then you would kind of get back in that, well, he's successful because of Dabo pigeonhole. Maybe he wants to go somewhere else and make a name for himself somewhere else. I I don't know that, but that makes me wonder. I just don't think it's a slam dunk that people think it is. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I I think – there's a it's just one of those things that when it comes up and, and considering Clemson had a poor offensive performance it's natural people are going to wonder about that I I agree I don't know what we're going to see happen I don't know I mean I, I I don't know you're you're right and I think I think for Jeff you know I it's I think it's good for him to take some time and to kind of you know relax and sort of uh enjoy his time off and yeah and, and, and it's a good time as you're you know if you're a football coach and you've got a family Uh, It's a lot of time. So this might be the first time in years, years that he can actually spend Christmas and the holidays with his family and go see Christmas lights and put up the Christmas tree. And and, uh, I I think he's just going to enjoy that. Don't want everyone to lose. 
Uh, but man, it's uh, you know all about responding and, and just you know getting back to work. And that's what our guys did. Is a, a tough couple of days. Um, and uh, you know our our job. You know when when we fail, we fail in front of the world. And there, there's there's that's a tough tough thing, uh, especially when you're dealing with young people. <clears throat> so it was a long Sunday and a long day yesterday. Uh, Mental Monday. Get your mind right. Uh, let's let's uh, refocus. You know, again with the right perspective, take ownership, learn from it, let's grow from it, and then you get back to work. That's what that's what winners do. This podcast is a production of Big Game College Football Network. For more information, please go to bgpodcastnetwork.com. For 24-hour streaming of all Big Game College Football Network podcasts, please go to biggamecfb.airtime.pro. All rights reserved. Man, they've been asleep. What you talking about? Online. <laughs>